Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Tree of Life on this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. The scripture lessons this morning are going to remind us of the fact that Jesus Christ was anointed to be our prophet, the one who would come and speak God's word to us. But unfortunately, at his time, just as in our time, there are many people who will not listen to that message and reject it outright. The order of service for you this morning is printed in your bulletins. I'm Pastor Richard Schleicher. I'm serving the vacancy at Grace Lutheran in Charlotte, and Pastor Rockoff and I are exchanging pulpits today so that Pastor Rockoff can conduct the call meeting at Grace following their worship this morning. So we will begin our service now with the singing of the first hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless swearing and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The first lesson for this morning, the Old Testament lesson, is recorded in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, the first chapter, beginning with the first verse. Jeremiah was chosen by God as his prophet even before he was born. And as a true prophet, he is sent by God to proclaim God's message to his people. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow to build and to plan. Here ends the first lesson. The congregation will respond with the two hymn verses as prayer. in the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. Here we are reminded of the fact that God's word needs to be preached. It is powerful, and it will accomplish God's purposes of saving souls. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone, up, gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long 
I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Here ends the lesson. Alleluia. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. Out of respect for the words of Christ our King, we rise for the reading of the gospel. <coughs> The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 20th verse. Jesus here announces the fact that he is the great prophet who has been sent from God. And those who heard his testimony rejected him and tried to kill him. These words are also the sermon text for this morning. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. This is the gospel of our Lord. We now join in the confession of our Christian faith using Luther's explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. We join together. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. The congregation may be seated and continue with the next day.
Grace, peace, and mercy be yours from him who is, and who was, and who is to come. Amen. The text that I'd like to consider with you is that gospel lesson from Luke chapter 4, which was read for you just a few moments ago. That gospel lesson, of course, is a continuation of last week's gospel lesson, which, of course, you did not hear because we did not have church here last week. But it was one in which Jesus was invited to preach at the synagogue, and he opened the scroll to the book of Isaiah, the 61st chapter, and he read there regarding that promised Messiah and told the people plainly, as you heard in the opening verse of our gospel lesson this morning, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is our great prophet, who comes to bring God's word to us, fellow recipients of that word. Back in the 1800s, there was a man uh, in a European village, a great violinist, who had garnered considerable praise from the people. He had a priceless Stradivarius violin, and he gave one impressive performance after another. And during his concerts, the patrons would whisper to one another as they heard that violin played. And the next day, the critics would review his performance, and they would almost invariably have the same comment after each performance, saying, this is something wonderful. We have heard the music from the Stradivarius. Didn't make any difference where this violinist played, whether he played in a church or whether he played in a concert hall, or whether he was giving a command performance before royalty. The comment seemed to be consistent. The critics would invariably say, this is something wonderful. We have heard the music from the Stradivarius. But it didn't take very long before that violinist got tired of hearing all of those accolades about his violin. And so very frustrated, one afternoon he set out from his hotel with a purpose. He was going to go to the musical pawn shop, and when he arrived there, he picked out and paid for an old, worn-out, weathered violin. It sold for something like $5, a very minimal amount of money. He took that instrument back to his hotel room. He put on a few coats of polish on that weathered instrument. He replaced the strings on it, and he gave that instrument a good tuning. And that night, at his performance, he took that $5 fiddle, not his Stradivarius, to that sold-out concert. And standing in front of the rich and famous, he played that $5 fiddle, not his Stradivarius. He placed that violin under his chin, and for two hours, his fingers flew across the strings of that $5 fiddle, not his Stradivarius. And then finally, he was finished with his concert. And the last note echoed throughout the concert hall, and the people, one by one, jumped to their feet. And while he was basking in the applause that came from those thousands of clapping hands out there in the audience, he finally returned to his dressing room, and he stood there impatiently waiting for the reviews of his concert. His manager arrived in his room not too long after. And the violinist asked him, well, what did they say? And the manager replied to him, the concert was a success. Everyone said, this is something wonderful. We have heard the music from the Stradivarius. I feel sorry for that violinist, don't you? After all, nobody likes to be ignored. Nobody likes to be written off. Remember hearing the story of a pastor who was having a church picnic at his congregation, and one of the senior members of the church had been away on vacation and had not been notified of the upcoming church picnic. And it was Saturday evening, and all of a sudden the pastor remembered that this influential member had returned to town and hadn't been notified about the picnic so he quickly picked up his phone and he called the lady 
with a very apologetic phone call to tell her about the picnic the following day. And she brushed aside his regrets with a cold reception and she said to him, Reverend, don't say that you're sorry to me. It won't do any good. I've already prayed for rain. I feel sorry for that minister. I feel even more sorry for that lady. But the truth is, nobody likes to be ignored. Nobody likes to be written off. Think back to your childhood days. Were you ever, when your school classmates were picking up sides for a game, picked last? Were you ever consistently picked last? How did you feel about that? It's a terrible feeling, isn't it? To be considered the worst player possible. Because nobody likes to be written off. Gentlemen, did you ever ask a girl out for a date and have her look at you as if you were some slimy thing that crawled out from under a rock? Nobody likes to be written off. Ladies, did you ever sit by the phone and wait patiently for that phone to ring, expecting a phone call from that secret admirer that you had who you hoped was going to ask you out for a date and yet the phone never rang? The silence of that phone was deafening. Nobody likes to be written off. And of course, things don't change that much as we get older. The wife of 20 years doesn't want her birthday or her anniversary to be forgotten by her husband. And the husband of two decades still has an ego which demands that he'd still be told occasionally that he's still giving Brad Pitt a run for his money. Nobody likes to be written off. And we don't like it when somebody's promoted ahead of us at our job. We don't like it when we become senior citizen and citizens and the kids forget to call home and check in with us periodically. Because nobody likes to be written off. Nobody likes to be ignored or to be forgotten. It's bad for those who do the forgetting and it's bad for those who are forgotten because nobody likes to be written off. Nobody, and especially God. Maybe that's why God in the pages of Scripture keeps reminding us over and over again that we need to remember him and to remember what he has done for us. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, no less than 15 times in that book, the Lord tells his people that they should remember. Remember, remember, remember. It sounds like a broken record as you read that book. But the reason why it sounds like a broken record is because humanity's history is a broken record. We sin, we are punished, we confess our error, God delivers us, we are restored, we forget and the process begins all over once again. And it's sad. No, God doesn't like to be written off. God does not like to be forgotten. And I cannot imagine a sadder example of God being written off than when Jesus Christ returned to his boyhood town of Nazareth, as it's recorded in our gospel lesson this morning. Now think about it. Jesus returns to the town he had grown up in. And maybe when he hit town that day, he walked around the old neighborhoods and he reminisced about the good old days, recalling some of the events that happened while he was growing up. Homecomings like that, and we make those homecoming at, homecomings at time when we return to the place where our roots are as well. Homecomings like that should give us a chance to remember the people and the places that have shaped us. Homecomings should give the folks in the hometown the chance to catch up with the local guy or gal who has made good, to see how they came out and what they've been doing with their life. And when a hometown hero comes home, well, 
depending upon the status of that hero, there might even be some sort of a celebration in the town. There might be a parade and the opportunity for someone boring to stand up and speak a few words about the individual. That's also the time when you can nudge one another as residents of that hometown and smile knowingly to one another and confess, I always knew that that kid was going to grow up to be something good. And there are others who might proclaim, oh, I remember changing his diapers when he was a baby. And somebody's sure to say, well, I was his teacher and I taught him everything that he knows. Everybody glows and beams and boasts about the hometown hero. That's the way it's supposed to be. But it was not that way when Jesus came home. Oh yes, the people of Nazareth were excited. They had heard that Jesus had been doing some miraculous things. A miracle here, a healing there. Water turned into wine in the village of Canaan. Ah, it might be okay for him to come here. We might be able to see some of these things. Wouldn't you like to see a miracle like that? Yeah, so they were pleased when Jesus came home. So pleased that when he went to the synagogue, they gave him the honor of being the one who was going to get up and preach that day. They let him read the scriptures. And as he opened that scroll to the 61st chapter of Isaiah's book and read those words of prophecy about the coming Messiah, and then he ended with probably the shortest sermon ever preached, which simply said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They were amazed. He seemed to be someone with authority, and his preaching seemed to have authority, like he was somebody special. But that claim that he made, that today that scripture was fulfilled in their hearing, what he was saying by that is that he was the fulfillment of that prophecy of the coming Messiah. He was God in the flesh, standing in their presence, the divinely sent deliverer. And that was too much for his old friends in his hometown. They write Jesus off. Who in the world does he think he is? I know who he is. He grew up here. He played with my son. He wasn't so big back then. He was Joseph the carpenter's son. And he started his apprenticeship here with his father Joseph in the carpentry shop. Oh, they may have been good carpenters, but being a good carpenter is a far cry from being the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. And they just would not believe Jesus' words. They wrote him off. And they want their local boy to perform some miracles. Not to stand there and proclaim himself to be the Messiah. And they wrote him off so strongly that they reached the point that they were ready to take him out to the cliff on which that city was built, that village was built, and throw him off the cliff to kill him. That's how frustrated they were and how severely they were writing him off and his claims of being the promised Messiah. And it's at that time, as they're dragging him out of the city to that cliff, that Jesus performs that miracle for them. Not the miracle they wanted. No. He didn't bring somebody back from the dead. He didn't restore sight to a blind person. He didn't cure a leper. He didn't restore healing to a deaf person. No. As they're dragging him out, he simply <coughs> frees himself from their grasp walks right through the crowd, down the road, and as far as we know, right out of the lives of his childhood companions forever. I wish I could tell you that that was the last time that Jesus was written off. But it wasn't, and you know it wasn't. The truth is, Jesus spent most of his ministry being written off. The Pharisees of his day wrote him off saying, these things that he's doing, these miracles that he's doing, he's doing them by the power of Beelzebub, the devil. 
the chief priests of his day wrote him off, saying that he was destroying their nation. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, during his trial, wrote him off by washing his hands of the innocent blood of this person. <coughs> and things have not changed, dear friends, because even today, people are still trying to do their best to erase Jesus, to write him off, to ignore him. History books as we speak right now are being rewritten so that the name of Jesus Christ is removed and no longer appears in those books. Educators are trying to eradicate the Savior from the curriculum and the classroom. Many courts in our land, in sometimes subtle and not so subtle ways, are trying to write off the Savior. Freedom of speech can be provided to a pornographer, but may be denied to a student who wants to gather his fellow students together for a scripture study in a classroom at a school. The news media will gladly give coverage to the pastor or priest who sins faster than they will to anyone else of any other occupation or position. And you can look around you no matter where you want to look, and you will see that millions of people today, like the people in the city of Nazareth, are doing the very best that they can to cast Christ away and throw him out of their lives. Parents who would never miss their child's soccer game, who would never flinch at chauffeuring their kids from one activity to another, will never think of taking their children to church. Nor do they ever consider the value of the eternal destiny of their baby's soul. The common person will spend hours upon hours searching for the right restaurant, the perfect automobile, a good butcher, a gentle dentist, an understanding doctor, a high-powered lawyer. But those same people won't spend a moment considering the Savior, their salvation, or the eternal destiny of their soul. You can look where you will today. Things have not changed. People are still trying to write off the Savior. And God does not like it. He doesn't like it, not one bit. And let me tell you a secret, though it should be no secret to you. You can't write off God or his son. He's your savior. Oh, maybe for a little while you can write him off. Maybe for a few years you can pretend, pretend that he's not important. But the time is going to come, and it comes for everyone, when you're no longer going to be able to ignore the Lord. You are either going to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your savior now, or you will acknowledge him as your judge later. Because Jesus Christ cannot and will not be ignored. And that's what this gospel lesson today is all about, isn't it? God wants us to be saved. He wants us as part of his family. That is the very reason why he sent his son to this sin-sick world. To redeem us lost and condemned creatures. He sent his son so that you and I could have life. Not only life here and now, but eternal life in heaven with him as well. And the good news is it doesn't cost us a thing. God has done it all. And he offers it to us as a free gift. That is what God has done for you and for me and for all people. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ came to live your life and to live it perfectly. And then to offer up that perfect life on the cross of Calvary and thereby die your death as well. And on the third day he rose triumphantly from that grave to assure us that God had accepted the sacrifice that he had offered for the sins of mankind. And that forgiveness, life, and salvation 
are now ours. By his blood, he gives us new life, here in time and then hereafter in eternity. But remember, dear friends, nobody likes to be ignored. Nobody likes to be written off. Not you, not me, not God. So listen to him. Listen to him as the prophet sent from God. The one who comes with that life-giving message of salvation. Because in that message, he's calling you from death to life. Eternal life with him in heaven. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now with the offering. <laughs> We rise for prayer. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, in you we put our trust. From the day of our birth to the present, your goodness and righteousness have never failed us. Therefore, we come into your presence with great confidence, believing that you will hear us. You have entrusted the word of your salvation to apostles, prophets, and teachers. You have inspired them to write and speak your words in many different languages that the world may know of your truth and love. Now that precious word has been entrusted also to us, that we may daily demonstrate your love. Forgive us for our neglect in studying and speaking your word. It is your desire that everything we do or say be motivated by love. We may have helped the poor but been too proud of our generosity. We may have considered the welfare of others, but not at great expense to ourselves. We've often ascribed wrong motives to the very generous and envied them when they were honored for their good works. We've often been puffed up with pride when we compared ourselves with others. In words, acts, and speech, we have often failed to love. Forgive us, Lord. Send us your Holy Spirit to help us love as you love us. And as you showered your sacrificial love in sending your Son, so may our lives reflect that love. May the sick feel your love through your healing hand, and the lonely through your comforting presence. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who came as the light of the world so that the world may have light and life through him. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always amen this time all those communicant members of Tree of Life who desire to receive the sacrament as well as those guests and visitors who have made their intention to commune known to the pastor will now be ushered forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Also, take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for your sins. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.
This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. May this strengthen and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. This is the true Take body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this strengthen and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. Amen. May this strengthen and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross. May this strengthen and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Take and drink. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Savior Jesus Christ, given into death. shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the forgiveness of May this strengthen and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
rise for the song of thanksgiving. people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 You may be seated for the closing hymn. You remember me there. <laughs> I served 20 years here in the North Atlantic District. I was the District Mission Board Chairman at the time in which Cary was started. And what a joy it is to be here and see what God has done with this congregation over the years. So it's good to be back. Um, and my roots, as I say, are pretty much here in the North Atlantic District. So it's good to be able to serve the vacancy at Charlotte at this time, too. And Pastor Rockoff is there this morning conducting the call meeting and preaching at, for the service there. <coughs> Bible class and Sunday school begin at 11 a.m. There is a potluck also which follows this morning, so please remain for that. And Pastor Rockoff has asked me to announce also that the men's wings and the word Bible study is going to be held here at the church tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. And there are study guides for that that are available in the fellowship area. Then we are on the throws of the Lenten season of the church here. Uh, Lenten worship will begin with midweek services on Ash Wednesday, which is February 10th, beginning at 7 p.m. And then is there any other announcements that need to be made? Yes. <clears throat> this announcement is um, for the ladies of the congregation. And in your bulletin, you probably found a pink insert or whatever. Please take time to read that. It's about our Secret Sisters program. Um, we have not picked names yet for this year because we would like to get a few more ladies involved in it. And just want to re preface that the focus is prayer. It's not about gifts, it's about prayer. And to have a prayer for a person that you're praying with for the whole year. Yet during the course of the year, it would be nice if you could just pop in a card or two to let them know you're praying for them, like for their birthdays or anniversaries. 
We're also changing the program a little bit. We're going from February to February. So we'll start this February, and then next February we'll have a get-together, like a little outing so we can reveal who each other's secret sisters were. Um, so if you are interested, on the insert on the back side is where there's some information you can fill out. One additional um, piece of information we would like you to fill out if you feel comfortable doing so is there's some special prayer requests. And these are things that you already know about. For example, if you have a child graduating from college or high school, we might pray for that. Or just pray for your children in general, or a planned vacation coming up for safety for that. So if you already know ahead of time, that way your secret sister can pray for those things. I will be taking these today and next Sunday. You'll probably see this insert again in your bulletin next Sunday. And then on the 14th, I'll be handing out, <coughs> excuse me, handing out envelopes with your secret sister. Any questions? If not, you can. Any other announcements? If not, I will greet you at the door and have a blessed week in the Lord.